Okay, now we are at chapter five, which is the integumentary system. So now we are actually getting into new material. So we're going to cover the structure of the skin, the accessory structures of the integumentary system, the types of skin that we have and the differences between thick and thin, the functions of the skin, how we maintain homeostasis, and then we're going to touch on development and aging. So the structure of the skin, first of all, the skin is an organ. It is the largest organ in the body. It is composed of two or more different tissue types. As we know, that's the definition of an organ. And these perform specific functions. Dermatology is actually the specialized branch of medicine that deals with the skin. Its structures, functions, and anything wrong with the skin. So some facts. The skin is a cutaneous membrane, which is a dry membrane. As I said, it's the largest organ per surface area and makes up 7% of our total body weight. The thinnest skin is on our eyelids and the thickest skin is on our heels. So we have two main layers, the epidermis and the dermis. The epidermis is the superficial thin layer on the top and it is made up of epithelial tissue, specifically stratified squamous epithelial tissue. And the dermis is the deeper, thicker layer, and it is connective tissue made up of both areolar and then dense irregular connective tissue. So there's the epidermis and the dermis. And that bottom layer that you can kind of see is like a brownish color. It used to be called the hypodermis, but since they've determined it's not an actual part of the skin, now it's referred to as the subcutaneous layer and that is made up of adipose tissue. So that kind of cushions and insulates our body. As I just said. So areolar adipose tissue, it's highly vascular. And again, the subcutaneous layer. So the epidermis is composed of keratinized squamous epithelium. Keratin is actually a protective protein. It's made up of really tough protein fibers and it helps protect our skin. The epidermal layer has four principal cell types in its layers. Keratinocytes make up about 90% of the epidermis and as the, layer, as the name kind of implies it produces keratin and it's also made in the stratum basale. Keratin as I said protects the skin because it's kind of a waterproofing it's a sealant, so it doesn't let water get in or out, really. Melanocytes make up about 8% of the epidermal cells. These produce the pigment melanin. So this determines our skin color. We're also going to talk later on how it determines our hair color. But they absorb UV light, so that is why it is dangerous to go out in the sun too often without protection, because that UV light damages our DNA. So the whole point of sunscreen is to protect our skin and not damage the DNA by having that penetrating UV light. So that's why they say do not you know, lay out in the sun too often, don't go tanning, that kind of thing. Because you could actually damage your DNA and get skin cancer, which we'll talk about later on. So again, in the stratum basale, they have projections which actually extend into the stratum spinosum. And we'll talk about these layers of the skin in a second as well. Longer hand cells are made in the bone marrow and then they migrate to the epidermis. And they're macrophages that actually protect against foreign invasion. So they kind of act in immunity. And they're also associated with the immune response because they're what are called antigen presenting cells which you'll learn about that in AMP2 and the immuni immunity chapter. So these are kind of interspersed throughout the stratum spinosum, which again, we'll talk about those layers in a second. The final type of cell is Merkel cells. These are tactile epithelial cells, which function as touch receptors. Again, located in the stratum basale, these are the cells responsible for us being able to tell when someone is touching us or if a fly is on us or something like that. Okay, so the five layers in thick skin are the stratum corneum, stratum lucidum, stratum granulosum, stratum spinosum, and the stratum basale from superficial down to deep. 
So the outermost layer is also referred to as the horny layer. It's called the stratum corneum. These are actually dead keratinized cells because the keratinocytes are shed and replaced continuously. So this whole layer is shed and replaced continuously. What you're going to notice when you go from deep up to superficial is that the cells start to die as they get closer to the surface. They become flattened, their contents just start to disintegrate, and you're going to notice that by the time they get to this superficial stratum corneum, they're completely dead. The stratum lucidum is called the clear layer, and this is only present in thick skin. So the fingertips, the palms, the soles of your feet, this is the only place that has the stratum lucidum. We have a large amount of keratin in this layer. And if you have ever looked at the soles of your feet or even the palms of your hand, the skin's a lot thicker and it's a lot harder to cut that skin as opposed to if you look at your forearm or your leg. It's a lot thinner there. This layer is why the extra layer of keratin, the extra protection, makes it thicker and harder to penetrate. The next layer is the stratum granulosum. This is a grainy layer. It's three to five layers of flattened, dying keratinocytes. Keratinization is more apparent here, so waterproofing is starting to occur along with apoptosis. So the cells are starting to die here. The stratum spinosum is the spiny or thorny layer. We have living keratinocytes here, and they're interspersed with Lagerhand cells and those melanocyte projections from the bottom layer, which is the stratum basale. It's also called the stratum germinativum. It's one layer that is continuously dividing, so it's highly mitotic. Keratinocytes and stem cells interspersed with some melanocytes and Merkel cells. So this is the layer that is continuously dividing which is the reason why our skin is continuously shedding. We lose skin on a daily basis. So as you go up in the layers, the cells start to die. They start to flatten out. So they go from being highly mitotic, dividing continuously, to dead keratinocytes that slough off. So newly dividing cells are deep, as you go to the surface, you get less nutrients, the cells become keratinized, waterproof, and apoptosis occurs, and then you have dead epithelium on the top layer. So review the process of growth and keratinization, but in a nutshell, as you grow from deep to superficial, the cells, as I said, start to die, keratinization is apparent, and they get flattened out. It takes four to six weeks from start to finish, and of course longer in thick skin because you have that extra stratum lucidum layer. So some questions that I want you to think about. Why may skin crafts be required if the stratum basale is continuously growing new cells? So it's highly mitotic, but why do people have to have skin grafts? Well, if you think about it, if that layer is damaged, then those cells will not be dividing like they would have been because of the damage. So skin grafts can take care of that problem. And sunbathing promotes tans because it stimulates melanin production from melanocytes. So why do tans fade over time? Well, because the cells die and slough off. We already have talked about the fact that as it goes from deep to superficial, the cells are dying. And the superficial cells are constantly sloughing off. So as they're constantly sloughing off, they're taking that beautiful tan away with them. Okay, the dermis is made of connective tissue. It has a lot of collagen, which gives it strength, and elastic fibers, which give it that stretch and recoil. So you can grab your skin and kind of twist it, and it's going to go back to its original shape. We have nerve sensations, so this is innervated with nerves. We have blood vessel innervation, so it can deliver nutrients and remove waste. Remember we talked about epithelial tissue already and the fact that it doesn't have that nervous innervation necessarily like the dermis does, but it does not have blood supply at all. It is avascular, so the dermis actually has to nourish the epidermis. 
there are nerves going to the epidermis, but not as um, massive as in the dermis. And then again, remember epithelial tissue, so the epidermis is avascular, so the dermis nourishes it. Also have hair follicles here. So the hair that you see on your arms, they originate in the dermis. Two layers of the dermis, the papillary layer, which is thinner on top, and the reticular layer, which is thicker on the bottom. The papillary layer is areolar tissue. There are collagen and elastic fibers there, but they're thin and fine. We have blood capillary loops and what are called dermal papillae. They kind of stick up into the epidermis. These are responsible for our fingerprints. So the dermal papillae push up into the epidermis and give us our ridges, actually. Meissner corpuscles are responsible for superficial touch. So we can tell if somebody is grabbing us, but not really hard. And then free nerve endings for temperature, pain, itching, those type of sensations. The reticular layer is thicker and it's dense irregular tissue. So now we have thick collagen fibers and coarse elastic fibers. So very strong and resilient, but has that stretch and recoil. Blood vessel innervation is here and the hair follicles originate here. We have Pacinian corpuscles, which allow us to sense deep pressure. So now we can tell if somebody's grabbing us really hard, for example. And we have glands here, sebaceous, which are oil glands, and sudoriferous, which are sweat glands. So here is the picture of the epidermis and the dermis. See the dermal papillae at the top where the arrow is pushing up into the epidermis. So again, giving us our fingerprints and footprints. Then you have the papillary layer on top, the reticular layer on bottom. We have oil glands, hair follicles, Pacinian corpuscles, and Meissner corpuscles there. Oops, so the question, is the dermis thinner or thicker than the epidermis? The answer, of course, is thicker. Is the reticular region superficial or deep to the papillary layer? Give you a second. Deep. What layer of skin do stretch marks arise, the epidermis or the dermis, and why? I'll give you a second to think about this. Stretch marks originate because when you're pregnant or when you gain a lot of weight, the skin actually gets stretched too much and tears because yes, our skin is strong and resilient and has that recoil, but if it tears too much, if you put on too much weight when you're pregnant, for example, some people don't get stretch marks because their skin can recoil. Others, it's just stretched too much and it tears. And of course, it is the dermis where stretch marks actually originate. Remember, the epidermis sloughs off. So if it was the epidermis, stretch marks would be on after a few rounds of sloughing. Skin color, we have a variety of skin colors, obviously. Melanin has a yellow, red to brown, or blackish hue. Hemoglobin gives it a red hue, and carotene gives it a yellow to orange hue. The amount of melanin production is what results in skin color, not the number of melanocytes. So it's actually the activity of the melanocytes that gives us our skin color. And if you think about it, when you get a tan, you go outside and your melanocytes become active and that's what gives you that skin color. Of course, it's only temporary because after you're out of the sun exposure, melanocytes stop being so active and your skin sloughs off and there goes your tan. But it's the activity of the melanocytes that gives everybody their different skin colors. Melanin is synthesized from tyrosine, which is an amino acid, and it's stimulated by UV radiation. So again, going out in the sun stimulates the production, stimulates the activity, and you have a tan. An accumulation of melanin in patches can cause freckles or liver spots with age. Nevis is a benign concentration of melanocytes, so otherwise known as a mole. Albinism is an inherited disorder where the individual does not have the ability to produce melanin, so they are completely white. 
and vitiligo is a complete loss of melanocytes, which cause white blotches. Now they're hypothesizing that this is actually an immune system disorder, but they're still researching it. So certain conditions also affect skin color. So your skin color is an excellent tool for diagnostics. If you have a bluish hue to your skin, it's called cyanosis. And this, what this means is that you have decreased oxygen and respiration. So oxygen isn't getting to the parts of the body that it needs to. If you have a redness, it's called erythema. And this is actually an increased blood circulation, vasodilation. So your blood has come to the surface of your, to the surface. If you have a whiteness to your skin, it's called pallor, and it could be because of anemia or shock. And what it means is you have decreased blood or vasoconstriction. So if you're in shock, maybe your blood isn't getting circulated like it should kind of thing. And if you have a yellowish hue to your skin, it's called jaundice, and it's caused by bilirubin, which actually is an indicator of liver dysfunction. So tattooing, what layer of the skin is the ink being deposited? Why do they fade and why are some more painful? Well, it, if you ever had a tattoo, it goes down deep into the skin. It feels like somebody is just stabbing you repeatedly in your skin, or at least that's my take on it. So the layer of skin is the dermis that's being deposited. Why do they fade? Well, first of all, pigments fade due to lymphatic system flushing but also you have that sloughing off of your skin constantly happening. So as your skin is sloughing off and the lymphatic system is flushing your dermis, the pigment's going to fade. And some are more painful than others because you have more tactile receptors present. Oops, sorry again. Okay, accessory structures, the hair, the nails, and the glands. Hair is actually dead keratinized epidermal cells. It's on most skin surfaces, except for the palmar, palmar and plantar surfaces, so your palms and the soles of your feet. Some areas have a lot of it, like your scalp, your eyebrows, your armpits, and your external genitalia. So here's an example of your hair. The follicle is at the end. The shaft is what you can see protruding over the skin, and the root is actually underneath the skin. When you have your legs waxed, for example, they pull the hair out by the root, and that is why it's so painful. The shaft and the root have the medulla, which is your hair color, the cortex and the cuticle, which is actually the most keratinized portion. The hair follicle is a, has a sac, is a sac basically. And that's where your hair grows from. It has neurons and a hair root plexus and blood supply, which is why it's so painful when you have a waxing done and they pull the hair out by the root. The bulb is the onion-shaped based papillae. It has areolar tissue and blood vessels that help nourish the hair follicle. And the matrix is the portion that's actively dividing. Right there. The erector pili muscles are actually a smooth muscle that causes the hairs to go up. So if you get goosebumps, for example, if you get cold and your hair stands up on your arms, it's because of the erector pili muscles. And if you look, I don't know if you can see the arrow, it's right here, there you go. <laughs> and then there's the cuticle and the cortex and the medulla, of course, the middle. So normal hair growth grows in phases. We have growth, regression, and resting phases, and then of course hair loss. The growth phase is when it's actively growing, then it goes into a regression where it starts to die off, and then the resting phase where it's kind of in between the two, and then it will start to grow again. Things that can affect the cells of the matrix, like electrolysis and chemotherapy, cause your hair to fall out. Because chemotherapy drugs actually target highly mitotic cells, and your hair cells are highly mitotic, 
So that is why your hair falls out if you're going through chemotherapy, or electrolysis treatment, of course, targets the matrix. Alopecia is baldness, and your hair has a tendency to fall out in patches. Hair types, we have lanugo, which is on the fetus, vellus, which is also referred to as peach fuzz, terminal, which are your eyebrows, they're a lot coarser, eyelashes, and scalp. During puberty, some of the terminal hair replaces that peach fuzz, especially in your armpits, your pubic regions, your limbs, your hair starts to get coarser. The face and the chest in men. So men have about 95% terminal and 5% vellus. Women have about 35% vellus and 65% terminal. As far as hair color goes, again, this is caused by the melanin that you have. We have eumelanin and pheomelanin, so you have a brownish and then a reddish kind of thing. They're synthesized by the melanocytes in the matrix. Oops, sorry. And again, the amount of melanin production is going to decrease as we age. So when you're not producing melanin anymore, your hair starts to turn gray. When you completely stop producing melanin, it will turn white. Okay, skin glands. Skin glands secrete a substance, so they're exocrine glands. We have sebaceous, which are oil, and sudoriferous, which are sweat. Seba sebaceous glands or oil glands secrete what's called sebum. They're connected to a hair follicle usually, and they prevent the hair from being brittle and help keep our skin soft. These are functional at puberty. Sweat glands, we have two different types, eccrine and apocrine. Eccrine are more common, and they function in temperature regulation, and they're functional at birth, and they're kind of concentrated all over the place. Apocrine glands are stimulated by emotional stress and sexual excitement, cold sweats, if you will. These are functional at puberty and concentrated in our armpit area, especially. So the way you can remember the difference between apocrine and eccrine, well, the way I remembered it at least, Eccrine, temperature regulation. So, of course, these are going to be functional at birth because you always need to regulate your temperature. But apocrine are functional at puberty. And I always think of boys hitting puberty, being all sweaty, kind of like apes. So if it helps, it helps. If not, you know, I try. <laughs> and then we have some room in this glands, which produce earwax. This provides protection in the ear canal so things don't just go right in and also waterproofs it. So why do teenagers have problems with body odor and acne? Well, first of all, apocrine glands become function at puberty. As they sweat more, bacteria actually start to break down the sweat, and that is what's responsible for the body odor. With acne, oftentimes those sebaceous glands, which are again, functional at puberty, have a tendency to get clogged, and cause acne, or you might have a bacterial infection causing it. Oops, sorry again. Okay, the nails. The nail body is the actual visual portion of the nail. The free edge is what extends past the digit. The nail root is buried in the fold of skin, so you can see the picture, these are all labeled. The lunula, if you have a lot of vascularity, it's pink. If you don't, it's less pink. So you can look at your lunula and see if it's white versus kind of pinkish. It tells you where your vascular area is. The nail bed is also called the hyponychium, and that attaches the nail to the bed. The cuticle is also called the eponychium, and that's the stratum corneum proximal end. And oftentimes people will, um, when you go get your nails done, for example, they'll trim your cuticles to make sure they're not extending too much and covering up your nail. The matrix is the mitotic area, so that's where your cells are dividing and causing the growth. Function, it protects the distal end of the digit, also enhances touch and manipulation so that you can grab things easier, and allows for scratching, of course, and then that grasping. And again, dead carrots and eye cells, so waterproofed dead cells. 
This is just showing you the differences between thick and thin skin. So you can look at that when you have time. Functions of our skin, very importantly, thermal regulation. Vasoconstriction will decrease heat loss. Vasodilation will increase heat loss. So if you're hot, you sweat. If you're cold, your muscles will contract when you shiver and generate heat or exercising, of course. Also functions as a blood reservoir. About 8 to 10% of total blood flow in your resting state is held in your skin. Very importantly, it's our first line of defense in the immune system. It is a physical and chemical barrier against invasion. So we have keratin for waterproofing. The cells are really close together. Langerhans are the macrophages, has a low pH, and also produces bacterial cytochemicals to prevent bacteria from growing on there. Reduces water loss because of the keratin and also helps prevent UV damage as it protects our DNA to, ex to an extent. Sensations, we have cutaneous receptors, so Merkel and Meissner, pressure and vibrations in the Piscinian corpuscles, thermal sensations, so you can tell if it's hot or cold, and pain sensations. Excretion and absorption, excretion to remove waste like salts, carbon dioxide, urea. Limited absorption, but some, so transdermal drugs can be absorbed through our skin. Toxic materials that are lipid soluble can be absorbed through our skin. And then vitamin D production. Very importantly, vitamin D is required for calcium absorption, but it also requires sunlight. So you have to go out in the sun to an extent because that is what triggers vitamin D production. Also very importantly, the vitamin D that is manufactured by our skin is inactive. It has to go to the liver to be activated. This is just an overview of the integumentary system. If you are in slideshow mode, you can run this animation and go ahead and watch it. Wound healing, we have two kinds depending on the depth of the injury. Epidermal wound healing is superficial wounds that only affect the dermis. And basically what happens, as you can see in the pictures, are those basal cells detach and start to migrate towards the center and then they keep dividing, and as you can see, the epidermis starts to thicken all the way until it's repaired. Deep wound healing is when it gets to the dermis and that subcutaneous layer. Usually you have some damage behind and you have scars. It happens in four phases. The inflammatory phase, which is that first picture there, where you can see the blood clot forming. Cells are starting to migrate to fix the wound. The migratory phase where the cells are migrating to help that blood clot fill the void basically. The proliferative phase where the cells are starting to divide and starting to replace the missing cells. And then maturation where that scab that has formed will eventually fall off. The better your chance of not having a scar is if you leave the scab alone and allow it to fall off on its own. If you pick the scab off, you're almost definitely going to have a scar. So don't pick your scabs. Development, the epidermis develops from the ectoderm. Our nails, hair, and skin glands are all epidermal derivatives. The dermis develops from the mesoderm. So again, there's the layers, the stratum corneum, the outermost layer, dead skin cells. The lucidum, only present in thick skin. The granulosum is kind of grainy. The spinosum is spiny, and the basali is the mitotic dividing cells. As they go towards the surface, remember they start to die, and they become more keratinized, and they eventually will slough off. As we age, of course, wrinkles develop, dehydration occurs, cracking occurs, sweat production decreases, that subcutaneous layer is lost, and your skin thins out in general. Your nails become more brittle. You have a decrease in the number of functional melanocytes, so gray hair is a result. You might have atypical skin pigmentation around. People do a lot of things to try to avoid all of this from happening. Botox injections, laser resurfacing, chemical peels. But 
hopefully everybody can learn to be happy with themselves and everybody ages. It's a, you know, the bottom line is everybody's going to age. It happens. I remember my first wrinkle and I wasn't happy about it, but it is what it is. You can also have an increased susceptibility to pressure ulcers or otherwise known as bed sores. So if you're in a nursing home or if you know somebody in a nursing home, make sure that you are turned or you turn them, make sure they are moved frequently because otherwise the constant pressure will create this ulcer. Last thing we're going to talk about are skin cancer and burns. Skin cancer is caused from excessive exposure to that UV radiation from the sun or tanning salons. It's the most common cause of skin cancer. We have three major types, basal cell, squamous cell, and malignant. Basal cell carcinoma is the least malignant, so it's the least harmful, and it's the most common skin cancer. The stratum basale cells proliferate and invade the dermis and the hypodermis. It's often slow to grow and does not metastasize, which means it doesn't move to another area. Most of the time, in 99% of the cases, it can be cured by cutting it out. You just cut it right out. My stepdad had this on his arm, and they cut out a piece of his arm about the size of a quarter and about a half an inch thick. And, you know, he's, he was cured, basically. Squamous cell arise from the keratinocytes of the spinosum often on the scalp, ears, and lower lip. It grows rapidly and metastasizes if not removed, but if it's caught early and either treated by radiation therapy or removed surgically, you have a really good prognosis. Finally, melanoma. This is cancer of the melanocytes. This is the most dangerous type. It is highly metastatic, meaning that it moves often to other areas and is resistant to chemotherapy. So if you have any unusual markings on you or somebody you know, you want to look for the A, B, C, D. A is asymmetry. If it is symmetrical, it's most likely benign. If it's asymmetrical, malignant. The borders, if it has even edges, it's most likely benign. Uneven edges, malignant. The color, if it's one shade, it's most likely benign. If it's more than one shade, it's most likely malignant. And then diameter, if it's smaller than a quarter of an inch, most likely benign, larger, most likely malignant. And again, this is most likely just because it's symmetrical or, you know, one color doesn't mean you shouldn't keep an eye on it. So remember A, B, C, D. And then burns. Is, burns are tissue damage caused by excessive heat, radioactivity, chemicals, electricity, anything that denatures the proteins in the skin cells, so it breaks them down. They're graded according to their severity. First degree burns is the epidermis only, so like a sunburn, for example. Second degree burns actually destroy the epidermis and part of the dermis. If you blister, you actually have a second degree burn. Secondary burns kind of can be not so severe or really severe, especially in infants. And then third degree burns is the full thickness is destroyed. The thing you have to be careful about third degree burns, they're usually black or cherry red, but they don't hurt. Can you think of why they don't hurt? Hopefully you thought of something, but anyway, all of your pain receptors are destroyed. But very crucially, you can have a loss of a lot of fluids. So if you have a third degree burn, you need to get it treated immediately. Finally, the rule of nines is what's used to estimate the surface area affected by a burn in adults. So if somebody comes in and they're burned, you would use this rule to estimate the damage, basically. And this is adults only, not infants. So that is it. As always, if you have any questions, make sure that you message me. And that's all.